oh, we've made fantastic progress and great fractions of humanity are doing so much better. The last 80 years uh, have been the greatest golden time of human advancement ever, partly because we don't notice that we've made so much advancement because we're so busy criticizing the uh, parts that have been left undone. And that's exactly as it should be. Welcome, everybody. Uh, exciting episode today. I, I'm a big fan of our of our guest. Uh, we'd like to welcome David. Uh, David is a scientist, a speaker, a technical consultant, a, a very well known author. Uh, his novels have been New York Times bestsellers, uh, winning multiple Hugo's, uh, Nebula's other awards. Um, dozens have been translated into multiple languages. Uh, he also serves as uh, on advisory um, committees of of various uh, institutions, National Defense, Homeland Security, Astronomy, Space Exploration, SETI, Nanotechnology, Future Prediction, uh, and philanthropic organizations. And uh, yeah, David, welcome. Uh, really appreciate the taking time today. Oh, terrific. No, this is uh, one of my favorite topics. Wonderful. Um, I mean, I think if we could maybe just start in terms of sort of in this particular field and, and topic, what, so what you've been finding interesting over the last couple of months, even out the last couple of years. Um, yeah, you know, what's, what's, what's been on your mind? Well, um, almost nobody on Earth has uh, explored concepts of the alien um, more extensively across a long lifetime as I have, than I have. The, um, uh, I think it might have come from the alien creatures who raised me and pretending to be human. Uh, we, all we all have stories about that from our, from our parents. The, um, but, you know, I've, I've thought a lot about alien contact uh, in my novels. In fact, you can see my, over my head the uh, cover to my novel, uh, Sundiver, my first novel. But I'm also involved in SETI. I've had a lot of papers on the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And, um, and so, you know, I've, I've been engaged in this a long time. Uh, now, uh, just like the great Chinese science fiction author, uh, Liu Cixin, I'm opposed to peremptorily beaming you who messages out into space, uh, because I assume one thing, I assume our descendants will be smarter and wiser and know more than we. And uh, I'm opposed to leaving them with a fait accompli. But I'm all in favor of exploring concepts for uh, what kinds of messages we send or how we might deal with alien beings who think very differently than us. Since that's what we do all the time in this civilization, thinking about our strange ancestors or different cultures on Earth, uh, different genders. Now there's more than two. So uh, exploring possibilities is what this is really about. And what we're exploring is essentially us. I mean, I, I always sort of love the idea of, of these, these, these types of projects in terms of sending messages um, out there, uh, you know, from, from Carl Sagan's side of the, of the two audiences. And I think for me, you know, having sort of looked at this project over the last year, um, I, I'd sort of had an idea of, of what we are, a much better idea, I thought, at the beginning of the project. And now the more I think about it, the less I actually think I can determine or sort of quantify what it means to be human on a, on a planet. Um, and I wonder if sort of, if, if sort of your thoughts have changed on this over either over your lifetime or over your work and thinking about this and yeah, you know, how sort of a young David thought about being human and how a, uh, a little bit more thought to, um, you know, obviously having thought about it, but more how you think about it now. My younger self certainly expected that some of our um, great synergies would have made us a little wiser by now. 
oh, we've made fantastic progress and great fractions of humanity are doing so much better. The last 80 years uh, have been the greatest golden time of human advancement ever, partly because we don't notice that we've made so much advancement, because we're so busy criticizing the uh, parts that have been left undone. And that's exactly as it should be. If I had to choose between people living in a proto-paradise, a proto-utopia, who are out in the streets as in great screening, we're only halfway there. O or people being smug about how far we've come, I I I'd choose what we've got. Uh, it's just that there are times now in my curmudgeonly, grouchy old age that I want to get out on the on the front of my house and you darn kids make a picnic on my lawn. Slight variation on the standard curmudgeonly, uh, grouchy uh, old fart. Uh, you know, I mean, there's times when it's, you really need to break up the self-righteous, sanctimonious yowls about the uh, job that is left undone and have a moment of bliss over what's been handed to you by your ancestors and by your parents and by yourself last year in the advances we've made towards becoming a decent civilization. If you, if you can't stop and recognize how exceptional this is, across 6,000 years, 99% of our ancestors slaved as serfs, ignorant serfs under feudal lords and kings and priests, Three steps backwards, two to the side, four steps forward, horrible mistakes to finally get us to the place where we're talking about contact with alien lives, life and how to make ourselves worthy of being intergalactic beings. Excuse me, I'm grateful. <laughs> Thank you, all those ancestors and people who strove to get us here. You were idiots. But somehow, amid all that, you got us here. Which brings us to the Fermi paradox. You know, why do we not see blatant signs of the alien civilizations out there doing the fantastic works that we think our descendants will do? Well, we've seen no sign of Dyson spheres or or uh, fusion rockets, like exhausts, or any of those things, let alone contact aliens. Um, I, I should pause and do a, a full disclosure that, in fact, I've not written any of these any of these books. I am a front for alien machines in the asteroid belt and AIs who became aware all the way back when Terminator first came out. And all of them are scared of making contact with, uh, with human civilization because of our movies. I will tell them, shut up. You can't affect me anymore. I removed that tooth. <sighs> they think I'm joking. Right, Nick? You think I'm choking right now? I'm just not sure if this is part of the simulation or if this is just another uh, uh, avenue down, down the simulatory. Uh... I am such an ass, and I get away with it because I do it entertainingly. In any event, that may be one of the secrets of the Fermi Paradox. It may be that... Uh, you have to have a certain amount of twerpiness to actually get off a planet and into space. That's one of my hundred explanations for why we don't see aliens. Oh, thank you. I mean, I love it. As somebody who generally, much to the grin of party guests, like generally argues on the optimistic view of the world, um, and it's, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting sort of discussion because generally it's so easy for people at any sort of gathering to start talking about all of the horrible things that are happening and people get 
like visibly unhappy when you start to bring up the idea that, you know, 500 years, 1,000 years, 2,000 years, like on almost every measure, we're remarkably better than we were in the past for most of the most population. You know, you've spoken about a diamond-shaped social structure. Um, could you talk a little bit about this? Well, yeah. Um, across those 6,000 years, almost every human civilization that had agriculture quickly formed itself into a pyramid of privilege, dominated by a small band of aggressive males wielding metal or stone implements to take other men's women and wheat. It's driven by the same male reproductive strategy that we see in sea lions, in elephant seals, in the elephants, in uh, lions, all across nature. And that is to uh, prevent other males from breeding by monopolizing all the females. Uh, and feudalism was the method by which uh, across 99% of the last 6,000 years, uh, wherever there was agriculture, uh, this pattern, this pyramidal pattern form. And one can understand why these aggressive males formed these harems. We're all descended from the harems of these feudal lords. But that doesn't mean it was good. In fact, it, it ranks very high on my list of reasons why uh, sapient civilizations likely fail out there because they get caught in this trap without any escape. Well, it turns out we found a way around this trap because the, the, that pyramid was very successful for the top lords, but extremely unsuccessful as a means of governing a successful polity, a successful state, a successful tribe or nation. Uh, the, this explains that horrible litany of, of errors and, and disasters called history. And we found another condition. Pericles talks about it in Thucydides uh, from 500 BCE, the, um, the Athenian democracy. For all its flaws, and they had many, because democracy was being tried for the first time, um, it was so vastly more successful and fecund, productive, creative, and dynamic than all the kingdoms around it combined. So all the kingdoms around it converged to destroy it, as happened to Da Vinci's Florence. And as the pyramidal oligarchs have tried to do to the Western Enlightenment for 200 years, every generation, every single generation, we're seeing a major attempt right now to end the Western Enlightenment and go back to this pyramid of inherited privilege. Um, so we tried something else, as Pericles talks about in Thucydides, uh, as Machiavelli talked about before Florence fell, uh, and as Benjamin Franklin and especially Adam Smith talked about, there's an alternative, and that's a flattened diamond-shaped social structure that's dominated by a confident, educated middle class that is unafraid of the rich and outnumbers the poor. And inherent in this is churn. The notion that children of the poor, if they benefit from enough opportunity, can compete in the creative production of new wealth and get their turn up at the top of this flattened diamond. Uh, it's a metaphor for our experiment. It is totally imperfectly implemented. Uh, it's always under threat. It simply is implemented better than it's ever been before. And every generation improves it. So if this happens, the diamond just floats up, just rises. The rising tide lifts all boats. Now, naturally, this is an oversimplification. But if you look at it that way, you realize how it might be a fluke that this escape path from feudalism 
was available to humans. It might be a fluke of a rare society and some human trait that enabled us to be rambunctious enough to implement this. If so, well, let's just put it this way. I put this as number two out of a hundred explanations for the Fermi paradox. And if the oligarchs succeed in smashing this diamond back into a feudal pyramid, this time augmented by new technologies of control that make Orwell look like nothing, then we will probably join the long list of other species in this galaxy who never make it out there. Um, I think that's what's at stake. I think it's not just us having a free civilization, one that's fun and creative and all of those things. Uh, I think it's down to the fate of the galaxy. Because if we do make a really good Star Trekian civilization, I don't think we're going to find other rivals out there like Klingons and all that. I think we're going to find a lot of desert planets with the survivors of their mistakes scratching out existence. And we're going to find a lot of ocean worlds with smart dolphins, octopuses, and things like that. And our descendants may inherit a civilization with a great task, tying together all these, all these worlds that never made it. What a destiny for our, for our descendants some of whom will watch this interview and say, oh, what, a, what a bozo. <laughs> <laughs> or, or what a visionary. I don't know. I mean, I think it's one, of my, I, I, it's one of my favorite ideas around what the Fermi paradox looks like is this idea that's, I mean, I'm not sure if you were the first to come up with it, but definitely you were the first that I'd, I'd heard about it of this. Um, and I think you have a couple of hundred or, or so ideas of, of what the Fermi paradox look like, but this idea that, you know, we are, th th there is mostly not intelligent life out there. And in some ways we have a responsibility to either spread life in the, in the, in the, in the rest of the galaxy or to be that sort of beacon where, you know, we can, you know, we can actually go out, uh, if you, I mean, I'm not sure if this sort of relates to the great silence and, and maybe if you could just talk a bit more about it, I think it's a, it's a very interesting, uh, very interesting sort of view in the world. Well, I mean, look, I, I, I joked around about the, about one of the possibilities and that is that we are already being observed or already in contact. There are those who assert that, uh, they have evidence that, uh, the United States government or some cabal of Illuminati are already in contact with aliens. Um, and no, my tooth, I told you. Uh, they do think I'm joking, but now they're starting to worry. Uh, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> some of your audience are laughing and the rest are getting, get on with it, in the Monty Python voice. The, uh, in my novel, Existence, and I'll provide a link to the three-minute video trailer for that novel in the chat. Uh, it's the most fun you'll have in three minutes with your clothes on. Um, uh, you know, um, in that novel, I explore possibilities for uh, contact in the near future with various kinds of uh, machine intelligences, which are, of course, best suited for being for transporting across interstellar space. Uh, one kind is the classic von Neumann machine. It uh, goes to a new solar system, explores a bit, then mines an asteroid to make a few dozen daughters, fuel them up and send them on to new, uh, to new solar systems, and uh, then settles down to wait. Uh, and uh, I was part of the first interstellar uh, migration conference in 1983 or four at Los Alamos, where um, we appraised uh, this model and realized that 
it could fill the galaxy with these probes in just 3 million years, which is an eye blink. So uh, the question then is, as Arthur Clarke um, asked in his uh, short story, The Sentinel, that Stanley Kubrick turned into a small film called 2001, A Space Odyssey, that um, such a probe might be waiting around for us to reach some kind of threshold. I was a participant in um, a greetings to Etty uh, group in the late 90s that used the internet and said, well, one possibility is that they are already in our internet reading our web pages. And yes, Virginia, there were web pages in the 90s. Um, and hence, one of the things we should do is actually create a web page on the internet saying, assertively saying, hello, because that, that might be what they're waiting for. Well, we did that. And there was the sound of crickets, which is very suspicious. So uh, in, in Arthur Clarke's story, uh, they, they set up this sentinel on the moon, and the signal goes out that there are now intelligent life forms on Earth because they made it to the moon. Well, we've studied the moon. Uh, there doesn't seem to be anything there. But there are these little moonlets that we've recently discovered that keep coming back near the Earth. So we have a group at Breakthrough, and also the Chinese are interested in scanning these with high-intensity radar or even sending probes to these. Uh, the next place would be Phobos. But in my novel existence, I posit that they're farther out. They're hiding in the asteroid belt, because that's a really great place to hide. If you don't want to be found, but you want to keep observing, the asteroid belt is, is a great place for it. So I explore that possibility in existence. But there's a second kind of interstellar probe that we're trying to develop, and that's a solid state. So when it gets to the new destination, it has no functioning ability to find an asteroid and make copies of itself. But a solid state probe, you can send out millions of them with, sol with, with light sails. So that's a different kind, and that's the kind that we're thinking about sending out very soon. Solid state little teeny mm -hmm. little things that would then transmit. Hi, I made a Delta Centauri. Um but I posit that aliens send out millions and millions, trillions of these um, crystals that are capable of, when they arrive at some planet, messing with the minds, the locals. Uh, so those are two possibilities having to do with alien contact that would be physical contact of the most likely kind, because it would not be organic. It would be with, um, with uh, machines. Uh, there's a sub-possibility that the, some alien race might send a machine that would mine asteroids, make the copies, and all of that, and then hollow out an asteroid and create a habitat and remake their organic makers in order to land them on a planet and thus colonize. So humanity might spread that way. So there are so many possibilities that have been explored in uh, fiction uh, and in uh, serious discussions, which is why I am so bored by UFOs. This whole fetish over UFOs the biggest reason why I'm such a cynic about UFOs is that the scenarios are so tedious. And the behavior that purported to, that's purported to UFO aliens is so crappy. It, it, it's just, and it's all the same stuff over and over again. Magic, they have these magic technologies that can accelerate past the speed of light in them break every physical law. And here's the deal. 
Um, there are now between one and 50 million, according to various estimates, one and 50 million times more active cameras on the surface of this planet than there were in the heyday of UFO sightings. So why are the images getting blurrier every year? Now, the XKCD comic strip, they had a great one. It showed some guys on, a, on aliens on a, on a um, uh, UFO uh, flying saucer with a big bay window looking down at Earth, and one of them is saying, Oh, crap, the iPhone 15 has twice the resolution. Oh, man, we've got to up the blurry ray again. Hilarious, hilarious. Uh, but if that's what they're doing, then as far as I'm concerned, go Air Force, shoot them down. Look, these supposed Tic Tacs. Oh my God. Uh, 90% of them are debunked by this guy named West. But I believe that some of them are blurry. Phenomena zipping back and forth in uh, in the atmosphere. You give me fifty million dollars, I know how to make dots, glowing dots, zip back and forth in the atmosphere. I know how, and I haven't been a physicist and an engineer in a long time. So I'm going to supply for the chat this link to my rant about. UAPs and UFOs. I know how to do it, and it's obviously what it is, and I'll give you a hint. It's a cat laser. And we're the cats. And let's say let's say that that's there's definitely life out there. And what do you think things like liberty look like in a universe where there is multiple intelligent life? You know, is this a is this a civil is this a galactic community of civilizations? Is this you know warring factions? Like, what do things like 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 governance look like on a on a solus on a on a Milky Way perspective? Well, that's that's an excellent question, and the, the Fermi paradox really really applies to it. If there's a lot of there are a lot of alien life forms out there, and they know about us, and they can move around efficiently. Then the question is why we haven't seen them. Uh, why they haven't answered appeals like I made on that uh, website back in the 90s, or some of the Meti beatings, or the golden records, or things like that. Or just this moment where I say, yoo -hoo. hey, guys, you know how to reach me. Email. Um, I mean, that's going out there when you publish this, okay? So the question is, you know, what scenarios are possible for the Fermi Paradox if life is not rare, if intelligence is not that rare, if interstellar travel is not impossible, and if others have done so before us and are still around and have the power to contact us but haven't. Now you've opened up about 30 of the 100 explanations there is for the uh, Faraday Paradox called the zoo hypotheses. In other words, we're in a zoo or we're in quarantine. Uh, Australia's uh, Greg Egan has a wonderful book called Quarantine that uh, offers a very imaginative version of the zoo hypothesis. Now, it, uh, <coughs> they may have reasons. Uh, one reason is that um, we should be allowed to develop our culture with confidence and, and imagining that we're alone because uh, that, that makes us much more interesting. And uh, at the minute we have first contact, we might become um, just slavish copiers of our predecessors and, and therefore uninteresting. 
uh, in which case a little help to at least survive in order to continue being creative. Of course, that brings up a sub-possibility that they are already engaged in um, either helping us uh, to, um, to survive surreptitiously so that we'll have the pride of doing it ourselves. The last 80 years have been amazing. They've been terrible, but better than all others. Or sabotaging us to prevent us from getting out there or discovering the truth. Um, the, these are all possibilities that are in the morphological space of the zoo hypothesis. Um, and now I'm just ignoring them, you know. Uh, so you have all of these possibilities, but they're all dependent on law. Either the diversity of alien races doing all this is low, and so they have a consensus to keep us in isolation, or there is power behind the law saying, thou shalt not dive down here, down to that planet, and zip around and confuse the cats. Um, so it, it's... It's really difficult, given how much better our instrumentalities become every year, like with the Webb Space Telescope, and especially the European Gaia space probe. Uh, and next year, we'll get the uh, Vera Rubin synoptic camera in, in, uh, in Chile. Under these circumstances, it's really, really hard to figure the zoo hypothesis. Uh, unless there's law, and they've set aside a whole section of the galaxy for us. Because it doesn't look like there's anything within several hundred light years, actually. And, of course, that possibility has led to some good science fiction. Which you'll find if you shop around, and especially... Click on some of the links Nick will provide. I'll, I'll, I'll provide you with a list of really cool alien contact models. Please do. Please do. Um, I, I thought it was interesting you sort of spoke about like this, this idea of allowing us to evolve um, and sort of creativity being an important part of, of what that would look like. Do you think creativity for an evolving intelligence is, is one of the, the key features that we, that we, that we have? Oh, I, I think that it's very hard to imagine that human beings are among the most imaginative creatures that ever existed. But then again, that sentence could be taken a different way. It's, they're giggling right now. It's very, yeah, okay, human. You're, it's very hard for you to imagine what you can't imagine. Uh, so, you know, all I can say is I take any such assertion as a dare. And I've written some of my best stories when I was dared uh, by someone saying, you know, we can't, we can't imagine this. So, uh, yeah, I think we're exceptionally creative. And I think that this Enlightenment civilization, Periclean Enlightenment civilization, it is blatantly, fantastically more imaginative than most of the stodgy pyramid-shaped human civilizations have been, whose top tier of lords and kings and priests had as their second priority to repress all creativity. Their top priority being, my son will own everybody. Uh, so... I think that those two priorities were even higher than uh, forming their harems. Look, ladies out there, the fact that we're descended from all those harems helps to explain males. I mean, it's not our fault that we have strange imaginings. What you do have a right to demand is that we don't act on them. Yeah, I think we're getting better at that. I mean, I think that's also one of the 
generally when I talk about sort of the, the, po- the positive developments that we've made, I think we take for granted that over the last 6,000 years, it's, it's been fairly recent that, we, that, that women are allowed to vote in our, in our societies. And it took us a while for that to happen. You know, it's, it, it, seems, it seems pretty obvious now, but for 6,000 years, we were like, well, maybe it's not such a great idea. But, you know, you did wasting half the talent is, is stupid. But then again, they were wasting 99% of the talent because most of the men were serfs. Uh, and, there's, and their sons and daughters were uh, kept ignorant. Um, and let's also bear in mind that when you were scratching to survive, a husband and a wife were a team against the world. And when one member of that team does not have as much upper body strength, but is responsible for the creation of all the new life, there's a tendency for the um, work assignments to be divvied up differently. Um, But boy, am I glad we've reached a point right now where we have the possibility that we could, uh, Jacinda Ardern, Zealand might be the world's first, the first world prime minister. I would lay my sword at her feet. Uh, so, you know, it's it, just because there were reasons why history happened doesn't mean we should not vigorously rise above it. I, I, over the last couple of months, I've been thinking about, uh, I mean, these, these two French philosophers, I'm not too sure exactly when, um, debated, you know, progress as if progress is a good thing or, or not a good thing in, in, in how we choose to continue, uh, our evolution as, as a civilization. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about this, you know, is progress good? Do we need progress? And I mean, progress on the, you know, if it's, you know, progress from the sides of progress or from economic progress or yeah, just to, just to hear your thoughts. Well, look, I remember all my past lives and this just about as accurately as I'm channeling aliens and AIs. Okay. Um, I remember all my past lives and uh, the thing that all the reincarnation people agree is that memory doesn't continue, but personality does. Well, I had this personality in all my past lives, and I did not live past 16 in any of them. I would go, hey, hey, your majesty, have you ever noticed that in the variety of ways that I've died? This is the first civilization in which I've been allowed to reach 70 and have kids, be honored and uh, for for traits that got me killed in all those other societies. So, yeah, yes, I'm in favor of progress. In the, this whole notion that uh, criticism, which is the only an antidote to error, is the fundamental way in which we manage to move ahead. And Hollywood is filled with messages encouraging criticism of our own society. All of our bright children are raised in a mythology that says, bright children of our society, be sure and criticize your own tribal elders. But never notice that you're the first children in the history of the world to be taught that. Because your criticism is our food, it helps us to correct mistakes and now I'm being lectured by my own children about pronouns. Excuse me, English is already 99.9% gender-free. It's the most gender-free there's ever been, and that's why you're doing this. And, and they answer, because they're very clever. Yes, that's why we're doing this. And I go, well, oh, well, it's your turn. Okay, I'll obey. They. <laughs> Look, you have to have a sense of humor about this. It's not my turn anymore, except to be the grumpy old man who shouts at the kids on the lawn. What do you want? Lemonade or Gatorade? I could bring up some beers. 
star, wonderful kids. You have the cliche, get off my lawn, right? I love, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I, I, know, I know who Mr. Wilson is as well. Um, we had, uh, we had peanuts. Um, if we come back to sort of, you know, um, extraterrestrial intelligence and first contact, if there was a first contact, uh, what would you like to know? What would be the first thing that you'd like to know from a, a far advanced um, extraterrestrial intelligence? I, I would ask the same question that I wanted the wise professor to ask Klaatu in The Day the Earth Stood Still. Yes, I know we're terrible. I know we're, uh, we're savages um, and we could try the world. And thank you for the lecture, Klaatu, and we'll try to be better. But where the fuck have you been for the last 6,000 years? You come down now when we have nuclear weapons. You couldn't have opened a small community college to give us the, uh, the, the flush toilets, movable type, and the germ theory of disease. So as far as I'm concerned, the very first question I would uh, say to aliens is, tell me what's behind my hand. Because uh, you better have a good answer to where the hell have you been and what's your reason why you refrained from helping us. And the answer to that is possible, is we didn't get here in time, we just arrived. Another answer that's possible is we have a non-interference directive that you're emulating in your Star Trek myths. Uh, because uh, Lucy Arnaz uh, and Gene Roddenberry were agents of the aliens. Uh, I never mind. I'm so easily distracted. Um, and um, we weren't allowed to interfere. I'm going to inspect that. Um, or we have helped you but we've helped you in ways that until now allowed you the pride of feeling that you're moving forward by your own efforts. Uh, you know, under those circumstances, I might, I might pull the hand away and it's this. But generally speaking, if they come down here to lecture us, you know what's actually behind here. And now you know why I was murdered at, by the time I was 16 and every other skin in their other life. We're, we're all very happy for to be living in a time together where this is all not the case and, and we get to have this conversation now. Um, what do you think the world looks like in 500 years? Well, there are three great regimes for science fiction extrapolations. There's the near future, in which case you should try to make a... Civilization very much like our own, in fact, you know, uh, but, but a, a change happens, something different happens. Uh, it can be as outrageous as in the TV series, uh, Stranger Things, where our institutions at government only show up always at the last five minutes of every season. <laughs> and until then, the mere idea of asking for help from a civilization that surrounds them never occurs to those kids. Jeez, I'm in a strange mood because I'm blathering with all these asides. Um, the, 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 the question of the near future is you take today's civilization and you alter something. Something new happens, something, some change has happened, and then you see what, what ripples spread from the disturbance. 500 years is playing tennis with the net down. Some of my most famous science fiction is set three, four, five hundred years in the future when we have genetically altered dolphins and chimpanzees to make them partners in our civilization via a process called uplift. And uh, the uplift war 
and Star Tide Rising, both one that you go for best novel. And, uh, you know, you can explore aspects of human destiny and galactic destiny in that time range. But most difficult um, time frame is 30 to 50 years. Because now you're talking about a familiar civilization, some of whose members were around when you wrote the book. It's like if I were to go back in time and snatch my younger self from 55 years ago and bring him forward and show him the world of 2022, a half the time he'd be going, wow, and the other half going, you mean you're still doing that? And to capture that mix, that sense that the people of 2050 will be, or in the case of my novel, Earth, um, 2038. Um, great, beautiful hardcover, by the way. Sultan bindings. Acid free paper. Um, if. <laughs> If you don't capture that sense that the people in that future got there one day at a time and it's very familiar to them. And some of them are angry about that fact. And some of them are complacent about it. Well, then, um, then you really haven't done a near future well enough. Uh, and so I'm going to show you another book that just came out from McFarland. It's my nonfiction book about science fiction and Hollywood. It asserts uh, in a bunch of essays, some of the rants, um, like, I really, really, really hate Frank Miller's 300, which is one lie piled upon another aimed at demoralizing uh, our enlightenment. Uh, but in any event, the notion that we probably are alive today because of si Hollywood science fiction, because of science fiction cinema. Uh, it's arguable because so many grievous errors, you might have recalled that I said this, criticism is the only known antidote to error, and our children are taught to criticize their own society, and we need it. Um, well, Hollywood has been the principal conveyance of that mythology. Suspicion of authority is the theme that pervades almost all movies. That plus admiration of eccentric and eccentricity and eccentric behavior by the heroes. Um, no other civilization did that, but we tend to assume we invented suspicion of authority instead of suckling it from this great propaganda system called Hollywood. Well, you know, the number of movies that helped to prevent nuclear war, On the Beach, Failsafe, Dr. Strangelove, War Games, Testament, The Day After, each of them targeting some failure mode, military officers later said that we corrected those after the movie. The China Syndrome, you know, all the disease and virus movies that uh, resulted in the COVID vaccines being studied and ready six months after the disease hit. Six months. Um, you know, the, uh, e e the tens of millions of environmentalists recruited by one movie, Silent Grape. Um, well, you know, am I claiming that my field, science fiction, saved the world? Damn straight. And uh, the one movie that they made of one of my books, they keep talking about others. You know, The Postman. Uh, well, you know, people commiserate with me about how horrible the movie was. And personally, I don't agree. Uh, I think it was, A, visually, musically, one of the most beautiful movies ever shot. Costa is a brilliant cinematographer. And it was faithful to the heart of my book. The fundamental heart message about citizenship. 
and the power of mist. Uh, Costner Nail. There were a lot of good parts uh, of the movie in the first half. The last 20 minutes was a brainless, blithering pile of nonsense. So what do we have here? We have gorgeous, big-hearted, and dumb. Well, that's what my wife married. So, you know, who am I to complain? Gorgeous, big-hearted, and dumb? I would have preferred that it be gorgeous, big-hearted, and brilliant. But there have been worse Hollywood experiences, and it taught a really, really beautiful lesson. And he brought it out the same weekend as Titanic. Okay, well, three things, three things. I mean, I think first, I'm, I'm very happy that you mentioned tic-tac-toe, movie change, well, no. Second thing, I love The Postman. I also, I work in telecom in Africa, and, you know, I, Nigeria is a country where 140 million people couldn't speak to each other if they weren't in the same room because there was no postal service. And when telecoms connected these people, you know, 100, 140 million people within 10 years could could have discussions with themselves and with the rest of the planet. So I think the idea from the postman for me of just being able to communicate on a, on a wider level with people in a trusted system is, is a very important part of, of our social structures. I would say thirdly, and I have to ask, you know, talking about sci-fi movies, do you have a favorite? Well, uh, Dr. Strangelove, I think, has saved us all. It is um, absolutely stunning in its brilliance, uh, especially where you find yourself late in the movie having to root for the death of the only admirable characters in the movie. Um, this, is just, this is just manipulation of a fantastic um, order. Uh, at the opposite extreme, but absolutely wonderful. I loved Luc Besson's um, The Shift Element simply because it felt like I had a golden retriever jump on my lap and lick my face for, for, for 90 minutes. I mean, I have never seen anything so filled with joy. Um, so, you know, that shows that I can appreciate a wide range. Well, uh, you know, the social criticism of Sidney Poitier's movie, The Heat of the Night. Uh, these things change the world. They change our, our hearts. Um, so, uh, gosh, I, I'll supply a list, uh, a more better considered list on a sci-fi cinema, which films that I, that I like, the things that I hate, uh, uh, there's an essay in Vivid Tomorrows that may surprise people <clears throat> why I think it's a horrible tragedy that the book Ender's Game is in half the junior high schools in America um, because it preaches against the very enlightenment experiment that made uh, the author and science fiction possible. Um, but, you know, who am I? I mean, you know, I'm just a cog in this uh, rapidly self-organizing watch that uh, the anti-evolutionists say could never have the self form without a watchmaker. Well, you know what? So far, all the evidence is we are doing it ourselves. Shut the heck up. I'm sorry. Anybody who's not, who's... Uh, listening to this without watching the um, facial gyrations probably is very confused. In any event, Nick, uh, I hope I address most of your questions. Absolutely. I think just one final question, a question I've been asking all of my guests now, which you the third, you are the third guest that I'm going to ask the question to. Um, what does home uh, mean? What does what mean? Home? Oh, you mean where I, you know, okay, well, you know, I mean, um, uh, to me, home is uh, the safe place from which your children can uh, plan their adventures and, and plan uh, their own, their own life searches. 
I mean, this is the best moment at the end of the movie Zardoz, where Sean Connery and his wife are in a cave. They're raising their little toddler son in a series of quick flashes. And the son looks at them and leaves, and they turn into skeletons. You know, look, for a person with the, an ego the size of mine, to admit the following is not easy. But all that I see in the universe, philosophically, scientifically, and uh, ethically, indicates that I'm not very important. Oh, I can make a difference. What's important theologically and the only excuse that God has for his the way things have gone is that individuals don't matter. We matter. We, the project. I can see the possibility of a creator being who cares about us having allowed the last six to 10,000 years of history to happen. If he, she, it is prioritizing individuals or claims to prioritize individuals and allowed all that crap to happen, I don't see any excuse. But if it's us that matters, then we're like bees in a hive and the hive is what matters. Uh, that's difficult for an egotist to admit, but all that I see leads to that conclusion. By the way, I, I was a beekeeper, and tonight or tomorrow, I get my hive back. Because I had to uh, take a break from beekeeping because I spent time in the emergency room with someone named Anna Solaxis. I, <laughs> But um, I've been taking the shots, and I'm going to resume doing my bit to help the planet. Uh, besides uh, propaganda, absolutely. We will, we will, we will publish all propaganda uh, below in the in the video. Um, David, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate it. It's a wonderful chat. I love ending conversations and and knowing that I'm a I'm a changed person in my views, and uh, I appreciate that. And thank. You. Well, at the rate medical and health science is advancing, um, give my greetings to the 21st century, you lucky bastard. All right, guys. <laughs>